Danganronpa is one of my favorite franchises of all time, and though I found myself gravitating towards the realm of 7th expansion as of recent, there are always a few key set pieces of the franchise that, for me, remain immortalized in the annals of visual novel history. It's been quite a number of years since the Danganronpa games were initially localized, which is around the time I first played both Danganronpa 1 and 2, and no matter how much new Danganronpa content springs up, be it sequels, spin-offs, or animated adaptations, I constantly find myself reminiscing about Chapter 5 of Danganronpa 2 as what I consider to be a perfectly crafted and executed murder mystery scenario. Kazutaka Kodaka's crowning achievement, which transcends the franchise and medium, and leaves its mark as one of the greatest vignettes to ever grace the genre of crime fiction. Aptly titled Smile at Hope in the Name of Despair, Chapter 5 opens with a daily life unusually drenched in an oppressively dreary, overcast atmosphere, pretending a particularly grim and sobering deadly life. And boy does it deliver, slowly building to a trial full of thrills, twists, and emotional turmoil. And even managing to slip in a bit of Danganronpa's characteristically pitch-black humor, superbly juxtaposed against an onslaught of blisteringly nail-biting drama, as is par for the course for the series. And at the center of it all is the game's most memorable and domineering personality, arguably one of the greatest characters Kodika has ever created, Nagito Komaeda. Nagito is a rather interesting specimen, having lived an abnormal existence to say the least, as he is both blessed and cursed with his talent of ultimate luck, whereby his life is inextricably tethered to an endless cycle of fortune and misfortune. This unique affliction and its accompanying trauma has caused his worldview to become horribly distorted, perceiving the dynamics of any situation he comes across as a never-ending, back-and-forth struggle between hope and despair. This leads to his desire to navigate the peaks and troughs of his ever-vacillating luck, by repeatedly aiming to plunge himself and everyone around him into despair as a gesture of kindness, insisting that the depths of despair will yield unbridled hope in the end. One aspect about Nagito that I find particularly compelling, and that I believe Kodika did an exceptional and clever job handling, is the evolution of his role within the narrative as it steadily progresses. The reveal of Nagito's true colors in Chapter 1, having surreptitiously masterminded the murder which kicked off the killing game proper, inevitably primes the reader to be laser-focused on his every word and every action going forward. So, as the author, the natural response is to subvert those expectations by having Nagito adopt a more subdued role going forward. Something which is accomplished ingeniously by placing him in the role occupied by Kirigiri in the previous game, as the protagonist's right-hand man, working in concert with Hajime to ensure that the trial proceeds towards some semblance of a coherent conclusion. But in diametric opposition to Kirigiri's brand of straight-shooting, no-nonsense sleuth, the freewheeling Nagito prefers to dole out pointers that are vague and duplicitous, sometimes doing little more than nudging his classmates in the right direction leaving it up to the star-studded ultimates to decipher his doublespeak, his own way of testing to see if their hopes are truly worthy of triumphing over the Blacken's despair. To me, it's a smart and resourceful way of mellowing out a character who had stolen the stage out of nowhere with a monstrously overbearing antagonistic presence, and it lulls the reader into a false sense of reassurance, as once Nagito has been relegated to this position, any mischief or subterfuge carried out by his hand starts to become similarly normalized. Heck, more often than not, his chaotic and unpredictable actions end up as the critical, unforeseen factor that ends up rescuing the survivors from otherwise certain doom at the hands of the Blackened, such as going rogue with his own investigative larks, or clearing the final dead room. Yes, there was always that nagging sense that somewhere down the line, the Nagito that orchestrated the death of Togami right under everyone's noses would return in full force, but not only would the survivors be ready for him this time, but there's always the chance that his radical, off-the-cuff shenaniganry may once again inadvertently resolve as the group's saving throw. And then along came Chapter 5, where Nagito showed us how we couldn't possibly be more wrong. Right off the bat, I love how Chapter 5's trial opens on an ominous, lingering shot of Nagito's portrait, conveying the sense that while Nagito, an irreplaceable and indomitable cornerstone of Trial's past, may have vacated this mortal coil, his presence is still very much felt, in borderline more foreboding fashion, looming like a specter over those left in his wake, snickering with amusement as they are now forced to fumble their way through the trial without him. The trial proceeds with surprising alacrity to the correct deduction that the instigator of Nagito's demise was none other than Nagito himself, a gruesome and assiduously crafted suicide disguised as a murder, involving a stomach-churning degree of graphic, self-inflicted mutilation, all with the apparent goal of steering the Ultimates towards voting someone other than Nagito as the killer, resulting in their collective execution. There's no doubt that a scheme like this is right up Nagito's alley, as he seemed to have an appetite for embracing extreme, life-threatening ordeals head-on, 
but as demented and depraved as the plan seems, Hajime expresses his gnawing lack of satisfaction at the explanation, insisting that Nagito's boundless capacity for malice would never allow for such a romantic resolution, a paper-thin, easily punctured mystery where they would all be allowed to walk away from the trial unscathed by pointing the finger at Nagito, i.e. the source of all of their contempt and suffering up until this point, and casting him, and him alone, to the gallows. The brilliance of Hajime's doubt at this pivotal juncture cannot be overstated, as it's paradoxically a gesture of genuine trust, the trust that despite Nagito's incessant, incoherent ramblings and heinous crimes, there's a clear, consistent, and calculated method to Nagito's insanity, a method that, while seemingly inscrutable to the world at large, is nonetheless so reliable from Hajime's perspective that he's willing to risk not only his own life, but the lives of all of his classmates on Nagito staying true to it. Monokuma even refers to his incomprehensibly earnest faith in Nagito as a darkly twisted take on the concept of friendship, and it serves to highlight the unique relationship between the two of them, that Hajime is really the only one on the island who, though he was loath to admit it, truly understood Nagito. It also really speaks to the thematic evolution of Danganronpa, having come a long way from the first game's black and white, hope is good and despair is bad, as we find ourselves waist deep in murkier morality here in the sequel, Forced to confront the unsettling truth that Hajime having gone out of his way to cultivate a close but exceedingly dysfunctional and toxic friendship with Nagito is the only thing that prevented him and the rest of the survivors from being ensnared by Nagito's trap. But thankfully, Hajime's vigilance convinces everyone to continue the trial, where they eventually converge on what they believe to be the truth of Nagito's plan, something even more malicious and deranged than anyone could have predicted. Nagito had engineered a setup whereby a fire would break out the moment the warehouse door was opened, forcing the group to use the fire grenades to put it out, not knowing that Nagito had planted a lethal poison inside one of the grenades beforehand. As there is now no way to determine who threw the grenade containing the poison which killed Nagito, their survivors are now faced with an impossible murder disguised as a suicide, disguised as a murder. All throughout the game, Nagito has been defined by his fervent desire to see hope conquer despair his dream being to offer his meaningless existence as a stepping stone so that the rest of the Ultimates, the true beacons of hope, may ascend to even greater heights. The brilliance of this setup is that it heavily foreshadows, both to the characters and to the reader, that were a final showdown with Nagito to occur, it would be one of clashing ideologies, with the practical consequences merely collateral. To that end, the conclusion the survivors have now arrived at precisely fits the bill and makes perfect sense. Nagito had sacrificed himself to engineer a mystery that had no solution, instead only a 17% chance of survival. In other words, a scenario so caked in despair in which only the combined hope of the surviving ultimates could triumph. One could even argue that such a plan is spiritually similar to Junko's Gambit at the end of Danganronpa 1, where she put her own life on the chopping block purely to create the ultimate face-off between hope and despair further ensuring this theory rings resoundingly true to both the characters and the reader, to the point where it's accepted pretty much without question. Which brings us to my personal favorite twist of the trial. Because while this hypothesized scheme is, on its own, already an out-of-left-field gut punch that thoroughly abuses the spirit and pushes the boundaries of Monokuma's game, it's revealed that there's so much more to it. Yes, it's a scheme that is undeniably aggressively Nagito-esque, anchored by his impassioned ideological preachings and his pathological penchant for malevolence and mayhem, but it's ultimately revealed to be Nagito's final feint. The brilliance here is that the tenets of Nagito's principles are so indelibly instilled in the minds of everyone, characters and reader alike, that it's so easy to overlook Nagito's vociferous desire to expose the traitor, something that had been reinforced over and over again throughout the chapter. Heck, Monokuma even makes mention of it during his opening speech, which, at this point in the trial, seems like eons ago. Like any good twist, it preys on audience expectation. In this case, the expectations of characters staunchly adhering to their principles in critical moments of conflict and adversity, which is all well and good in the name of drama, but it sometimes has rationality take a backseat in service of conveying a grander philosophical point, an obvious example being Junko's aforementioned gambit. Ever the maverick, Nagito, whose identity has basically been defined by his rampant pontifications, instead chose to go out with a bang using a plan concocted by someone of perfectly sound mind. Enterprising and fiendish, yes, but inarguably perfectly sound. His goal was to take advantage of the rules of the killing game to rid the world of all the remnants of despair, including himself, sparing only the traitor. 
Of course, during the initial playthrough, the only proper reaction to this revelation is to sit back and admire in awe, horror, and disbelief at the terrifyingly inventive and whiplash-inducing setup of Nagito weaponizing his esoteric talent to expose the traitor, whose identity eluded him until the very end. But upon reflection, I find I'm much more impressed by, and drawn to, the ingeniously multi-layered deception, both Nagito's double-nested trap within a trap, and Kodaka's deception of the audience, reapportioning Nagito's warped ideology to enable such a shockingly straightforward, self-righteous, and even self-serving goal. But in the end, it doesn't compromise the Nagito we've all come to know throughout the game. The plan still remains faithful to his identity, as his sacrifice would pin him as the foundational stepping stone for the brightest hope, the survival of the traitor at the cost of the lives of the remnants of despair, thus ensuring that his name is forever enshrined as the ultimate hope. And while I personally hold this revelation to be the zenith of the scenario, there's still somehow an entire arc left to resolve as the trial careens like a car crash towards its bittersweet conclusion. Chiaki's desire to protect the survivors as her role dictates allows her to overturn Nagito's master plan, but the final brutal twist of the dagger is that it's ultimately up to Hajime to prove to everyone that she is, in fact, the traitor, thus condemning her to death and bringing the trial to a close on an emotionally resonant and absolutely gut-wrenching note. While the entire resolution is suitably drenched in heartbreak and sorrow, my favorite part of Chiaki's farewell is how she optimistically reframes her classmates would-be condemnation as an expression of trust that the group is able to live on by believing in their friend instead of doubting them, meaning that, through her sacrifice, the remaining survivors are able to triumphantly shatter the sadistic foundation of Monokuma's killing game once and for all. Chapter 5 by no means comes out on top in every category, as some scenarios are far more mechanically convoluted, such as the funhouse murder that comprised the chapter immediately preceding this one. Some are more ideologically scintillating, such as Kaito and Kokichi's tug-of-war for Shuichi's trust in V3's virtual world murder. Some yank more forcibly at the heartstrings, such as Kaede's tragic decision to go lone wolf at the outset of V3. Some went out in terms of sheer diabolical cleverness, such as Kokichi's plan to end the killing game by turning Monokuma's own rules against him in V3's own penultimate trial, and some, well, some just plain exist in their own bizarro dimension. But the death of Nagito strikes the perfect balance between all of the above, taking a complex but not over-engineered setup that is founded on exploiting the codified rules of the killing game, and further obscuring it by recontextualizing the culprit's wicked philosophy and ambitions, forcing both the reader and the survivors to engage with and pick apart Nagito's disturbed psyche on a deeper level to reach the truth. For me, it's really the arc that perfectly encapsulates the essence of Danganronpa, a deceptively nuanced character study hidden beneath a theatrical psychopop veil of high stakes and maddening murder mystery. And wouldn't you know it, in the end, as a bonus, it even has the added benefit of demonstrating definitively that, without love, the truth cannot be seen. <laughs>